Uh, basically, you know, if somebody gives it to you to purchase something, whatever the it you they give you is, it's money. And Gord Huff here is our economics expert for 1632, and he's going to tell you about it. Okay. First, uh, I'm, I'm not a credentialed expert. I have no degree. I started studying uh, economics essentially because I, start, I wrote a story and, in, and needed economics in it. So I started studying it. At this point, I have read Marx and Smith and Greenspan and Friedman and Keynes and a whole bunch of other people. And pretty much, I got to admit that the only one who doesn't sound like he's trying to sell me a used dragon is John Maynard Keynes. And Smith was trying to sell the nobility of the time, the kings and parliaments of the time on the notion of middle class mobility and laissez-faire capitalism. Mm -hmm. Marx, in response, was trying to sell 19th century populists on the evils of laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, and both of them were right. But both of them were working from a very marked political agenda. So John Maynard Keynes wasn't. Best I can tell, when John, when John Maynard Keynes wrote his um, economics work, he didn't like it. He, dis, he emotionally disagreed with what he was writing, but that was where the numbers were taking it. And from everything I've been able to find out about Keynes himself and the stuff he wrote, he did not like what he was having to write. Friedman was definitely working off a political agenda, and so was Greenspan. The truth of the matter is a little more complicated and a lot less idealistic than any of them have come. The <coughs> conclusions I've come to over studying both our economics over the last 10 years, the economic history from now back to the Romans, and the alternate histories, not just Eric's, but others, that include economics, counterfactuals, is that economics is in fact a chaotic system. It is not, the, one of the interesting things about chaotic systems in general is that they can be approximated by statistical models, but not accurate. There, the degree of accurately that you can of accuracy that you can get with a statistical model on a chaotic system is low. You can t use it to predict the weather, but not well. You can use it to predict economic occurrences, but not well. It does not work well with chaotic systems. It works, but not well. When Smith was writing, when Marx was writing, when Greenspan started writing when uh, Friedman was writing, there really wasn't uh, chaos math. It didn't exist yet as a useful system. That happened about the time that Greenspan and Friedman started, and they already had their systems established. The second big thing that I have picked up is that money is worth what people think it's worth not what the average of people think it's worth. What you think it's worth, 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 what you think it's worth. Not what your aggregate thinks it's worth. Okay? If you don't think, if you think your dollar is worth more than that glass of Coke, you won't buy the glass of Coke for a dollar. It's all very circumstantial, and even what you think it's worth changes drastically. If this were not true, there would be no such thing as stagflation. None of the models, not Friedman's, not Greenspan's, not Keynes, not Smith, none of them handle stagflation well. 
Greenspan and Friedman, having written most of their stuff after the 70s, after the big stagflation of the 70s, work the numbers to, to make it sort of look like they sort of work with it, but none of them actually did. Okay, we've got a couple of things now that I think I'm confident of. One is that economics is a chaotic system, that there are, and like all chaotic system, it is a system of attractors. Does anybody know what an attractor is in chaos theory? I would define it as it's where you tend to end up if, if, if you're trying to be too precise if, and you're being too vague. Let me, let yeah, me I know exactly. I'm trying to think how can I say this without talking about state space? And I don't want to talk about state space. I'll All let right, you no. do um, Anybody know what centrif centrifugal force is? Centripetal, centripetal force? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, centripetal, centripetal or centrifugal? Centripetal or centrifugal? Yeah, which in one? In or out? In. Centrifugal, right? Centrifugal. Pedals that spit stuff out. Okay. Well, centrifugal forces. Centrifugal is simply Newton's first law. Right. Centri centrifugal in is anything. It's you're deciding to take a right turn and you turn the steering wheel. Centrifugal force is an attractor. It's a point okay. attractor. It, and it, all the tractors have this in common. They're, they're, not, they're mathematical constructs to describe a variety of different forces. So whether it's you turning your steering wheel to make a right turn causing a centrifugal force pulling the car around in a circle, or the force of gravity, it doesn't matter. Any force that causes something to curve around is a centrifugal force. The centrifugal force is a point attractor. There are also line attractors, curve attractors, and weird shape attractors. Strange. And they all pull things toward them, but, and they can all be described. In economics, two of the big ones, call them the sinews that guide the invisible guiding hand that Smith talked about so much, are the slavery attractor, and the innovation attractor. They're not the only two sinews that guide the guiding hand, but they're two of the most powerful. They're the ones that move the wrist. What they are is, and they, they conflict with each other, they don't balance out. Slavery attractor is a zero-sum game. And again, the zero-sum game is a real part of economics. It doesn't balance out to a non real zero-sum game. There's the zero-sum game that it produces the slavery attractor and the positive-sum game that produces the innovation attractor. Here are two examples. If you have a machine that will build, that will make pins, a plastic injector that will make pin bodies or combs or something else like that, and will make 10,000 of them at 10 cents a piece, versus a machine that would make a 10,000 of them at a dollar a piece. You've saved the world a great deal of money and you've made the world richer. And that is a non-zero-sum game. Everybody's a little bit richer because cones are a little bit cheaper. It works for everybody and it works to everybody's advantage, except the advantage of the guy who was making cones at a buck a piece. Right? On the other hand, if you have 500 people working for you, and they can go across the street and get a really good job that pays just as well today. You had better, you had better offer them a lot or they are going to leave. If you have 500 people working for you and they can't get another job, you can offer them dog scraps and they will stay and work. That's the slavery attractor. These two attractors don't average out. They circle around each other. Together they make up a strange attractor that is a powerful force in moving economics. The more one is restricted, the more powerful the other becomes to an extent. But neither one of them can exist without the other because you cannot take away all the ideas, all the, when you give somebody a 
patent on a new invention, you're making a, you're not just making a freedomist, you're an innovation attractor, you're making at least a temporary slavery attractor. Because at the same time, you're giving somebody, uh, you're, because you're giving somebody a monopoly over the use of this technology. For what? And all, and what's been happening, what happened up until about the early modern period was that the slavery attractor, through, simple, through simply the structure of, of the economics of the time, was the overwhelmingly dominant attractor. Slavery in one form or another controlled societies from, from the time we left hunter-gatherers till the early modern period. Whether it was serfdom or chattel slavery or even to an extent economic slavery where you, get, you took the job or you starved. The villagers and towns, they had charity, they provided charity, but you worked for it. And you worked on their terms. And you're, if you did get ahead, the money often wasn't transferable. So you were pretty much owned by your circumstance, unless you were one of the very few very wealthy people. The, one of the things that happened in the early modern period and the thing that changed the early modern period into the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th and early, and into the 19th and 20th century was changes in economic structure. The gold and silver system in which the value of money was determined primarily by its content and purity of silver meant, meant that the economic system was very limited. Keynes talks about the stickiness of monetary effects. So does Friedman, by the way. That they both drastically underestimate. It is amazingly sticky. It is so sticky it becomes permanently sticky. You get, nobody wants to lower their prices unless they're forced to it. Nobody wants to believe that, well, nobody accepts that money is worth more today than it was yesterday. It's just not natural for people to think of money is worth more than it was yesterday, especially paper money. This was less true of silver and gold, but it's very, very true of silver of paper money. This is why when all right, uh, I'm gonna have to go back a little bit and talk a couple of numbers. M V M times V equals P times Q. This is <laughs> famous old monetarist truism, and it's not true. I thought it was true. I really did when I went through you most of this study. You at least one article. I did. I did. I put it in an article, and I was absolutely convinced it's true. What, you, what they're doing when they do this is they're, they're doing a truism because the amount of, they're, they're, they're saying the total amount of money is worth equal to the total amount of money on both sides of the equal sign. Because the quantity of goods times the price of the goods is equal to the uh, total amount of dollars times the, not the amount they're, they're moved.